But I wonder what the voice crying out in your wilderness looks like in our lives today. Where is the wilderness that you find yourself in? And what is the voice? What does it sound like? What does the voice in the wilderness of your life sound like in 2015? Does it sound like the organ bellowing forth angels we have heard on high? Does it sound like the trumpet blast of Handel's Messiah? Or does it sound like the sweet, soft flute? Whispering notes in the silence of the darkness mourn. Let us pray. God of light, inspire us once again to look deep within our hearts and the corners and those hidden places that we might see what, where you are needed most and we may hear your call in our wilderness today. In Jesus' name, amen. For weeks before Christmas, um, my sister and I would spend hours right in front of the TV, on the floor, turning the pages, ooing and eyeing over one book. No, not the Bible, the J.C. Penny catalog. <laughs> weeks before, maybe even weeks before Thanksgiving when it came, you know, the J.C. Penny catalog. Sometimes I've heard it was the Caesar's Roebuck catalog. But you turn the pages of that toy section in the back, and you just make a list of things. I mean, Karen and I would ponder the things that we would hope to see crammed underneath our tree. And like I asked the children today, those lists became long. They became vast documents. I guess nowadays we have to, you know, security link it together with, you know, back it up on four different hard drives. <laughs> Uh, but we knew that some, one day in the next couple of days, we would have to filter through and decipher what was the needs and what was the want. Of course, to a seven-year-old, what's the difference between a need and a want? So anyway, we, we did have fun, and we would devise our lists, and we would wonder what we were going to get. You know... Children are not the only ones who need the chance to ponder what we're going to get for Christmas. What we're going. Advent gives us this time. Adults, you and I also need this time to ponder and to reflect upon that mysterious morning. Whenever it happens, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen next week, it can even happen in January. It doesn't have to happen on the 25th. I mean, that's our day that we celebrate. But any mysterious day that the light dawns on us, that morning happens, we need time to sit in front of each other and talk about what we're going to get. One year I wanted a sweater. No, no, not just any sweater. This was a particular sweater. It, I was yellow. I, I was 80s. Remember, the 80s were the times of flamboyant colors, you know, pinks and neon greens and yellows. Oh, that was great. This particular sweater I saw in the window of Bridges in Georgetown, right outside D.C. Now, Bridges had all these little uh, shops, and they were, it, you had to have a label. And of course, in the 80s, one of those labels was Bridges of Georgetown. Oh, I can still see it fitted. I, when I close my eyes, I can see it fitted on the mannequin. I can see that yellow sweater. It was like a cable knit other design in it. It wasn't just on the top of my list. It was my list. This sweater. So Christmas morning had arrived and I had told everyone about this. Everybody knew that if I didn't get that sweater, I was going to do something drastic. But I spotted that box on Christmas morning. And I knew that that box contained that sweater. And I held that box and I opened it in anticipation and I unfolded that, that tissue paper, you know. And I carefully peeked inside, not wanting to appear too overly zealous. 
And I looked inside, and there was a sweater. It was a sweater. It wasn't the sweater. <laughs> I became confused, and um, it wasn't the one that I had expected. There's the key. It wasn't the one I expected. The disappointment soon faded weeks later as I found out that that sweater was just as good. It kept me just as warm, and that the girls still looked at me in this sweater. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that mattered anyway. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but Advent, this season in church, it gives us a chance to prepare for such surprises. It really does. It gives us a chance to say, what do we really want out of this life of faith? The same year I reached into my stocking, you know, Simpsons always do their presents under the tree first, and then we reach for our stockings, and out of the stocking came a box. And that box fell in my hand, and it hit a thud, and I was like, oh, good, a watch. <laughs> well, I opened that box, and I read on that box, and it said, soap on a rope. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I didn't know whether they were trying to give me a, a, a clue or some kind of a, of a secret message. But you know what? I, I grew to like that soap, especially as a teenager who wanted to smell good. Same reason I wanted to wear that sweater. What kind of gift is so far away? How do you say thanks and pose for the camera holding so far away? <laughs> Though not thrilled at first, I did discover the benefits of this utilitarian gift. This treasure soap on a rope was wonderful. It, it, was, it was always there. You know, you never have to reach for it with your eyes. You cloud it with shampoo. The soap was within reach, and it smelled good. It was a good gift, after all, especially for the teenager. But Advent, again, is... Not only a time when we ponder the, the giving and receiving of gifts, but it's also a time to reflect upon the strangeness of the gift that God is giving us. Malachi addressed the people who were expecting a different kind of gift from God. And they didn't know it either, but Malachi comes today and he says, I'm giving you a launderer's soap. That's what the scripture says. I'm giving you a refiner's fire. Malachi spoke to people long after they had returned from Babylonian exile. Remember, Babylon came in and there were prophets and messengers who told Judah that, you know, you all better watch out because the, this Babylon, this neighboring kingdom is going to come in and wipe you out if you don't straighten up. If you don't get your act together, they're going to come in, take you captive, and take you away from here. Well, as it stood, Malachi is speaking to the same group of people coming back from this captivity. Years later, God in his infinite wisdom had allowed them to come back. And here they are, a people of expectant hope. They had such excitement and enthusiasm in their minds, they were making the trek across the desert with, they were almost running home. You can almost see the children running home to Israel. To Jerusalem. They were going to rebuild their walls of their city. They were going to rebuild their temple. They were going to take out the old things and have life the way it used to be. That God was on their side again. However, all they saw when they got home was brokenness, despair, and hopelessness. They expected God and this God who acted so justly and powerfully in releasing them from captivity they expected them to, to, to meet them at home and, and they would be great again. But among the gifts they expected, restoration of the boundary lines and the glory of their former kingdom were not in the pile of packages underneath their tree that year. They expected the restoration of the temple and renewed priestly service, a place of prominence and restoration and prestige and the restoration of the land, but this is a little more of a list than the sweater and the watch that I had in mind. However, the people returning from captivity found the conditions in the abandoned land so harsh 
that great effort was required of them even to scratch out the bear's necessity of life. Can you imagine coming home to Bahama after being destroyed by an outside kingdom and, and, and wondering what you're gonna, how you're going to rebuild? Dry weather, irate neighbors, ruined walls, crumbling buildings, destroyed vineyards and desolate fields. A hope of any quick and easy restoration had been lost in hopelessness and despair. The people who had made their way home from the Babylonian captivity were excited about rebuilding. But I think what happened was that they had their hope so built upon themselves and what they wanted that they couldn't see the new opportunity that God had led them to. Malachi saw their excitement fade because their hope was built upon a self centeredness <clears throat> about what they wanted and not what God wanted. Why would God liberate us, the Jews were saying? Why would God allow us to come home from captivity to this open land and not meet us here and not give us great blessings and gifts? And all of a sudden, they're saying, where is God? in the midst of what is supposed to be so good. Have we not asked that just this last week? Where is God in the midst of this nation that's supposed to be so free? Where is God in the midst of this nation that is supposed to be so safe that anywhere in our nation right now, something could happen that could spawn tragedy? <clears throat> These are the kinds of questions that, that kind of connect with us and, and we don't just think about religion and faith being some high in the sky. But where is God in the midst of these times? Cindy was at early church and she said, thank you for not backing off. There are wildernesses out there. There are wildernesses in your lives that God is coming to speak to. Yes, we want certain things in our life, and we want certain <clears throat> gifts, but God is ready to give you so much more than you're willing to accept right now. We, too, ask these kinds of questions in the midst of poverty, hunger, and, and uh, <clears throat> fear. I think it's fear. I got an argument this week over with somebody who's for gun control. I got an argument with somebody else who's against gun control. Of course, you know me. I said it's not going to make any difference whether we have more guns or less guns until this nation begins to spread the word of God in Jesus Christ and the peace of kindness. This nation's not going to get any better. People aren't going to be killed any more or any less by handguns until God's word soaks into everybody and we spread that joy and that cheer of God's love with everybody and preach Jesus Christ to the world. You all know I don't have a dog in that fight. That's why it's easy for me to say that. And I'm not saying that, that, that argument's not valid. And I'm not saying those two sides. It's not going to make any difference to right policies or not right policies. There's something greater in our nation going on than just the fact that we can write some policy to take certain things off the street, put things on. Jesus Christ needs to be felt. And he needs to live amongst us. And that calls for people to start, to start proclaiming the name of Jesus. Malachi had announced that the people were incomplete without the love of God. However, the gift of God and the gift that God was bringing to the people was a surprising one. That, that God would arrive with the gift of soap. I don't know whether it was on a rope or not, but it was soap because it was a refiner's fire and it was a launderer's soap. Advent is a time that we can sit in the bathtub and wash ourselves and bathe ourselves our preparation is one of bathing, Malachi says. Bathing in the cleansing word of God 
and reading and soaking in the scriptures that talk about God's peace in the presence of a wilderness. God's peace in the presence of a desert. There are too many people here, too many people around us in our lives that have this where is God mentality and there's not much hope out there. That's why you are the divine messengers. You are not necessarily prophets, but divine messengers, angels to a world, to take the hope of God from here, to take the nourishment of his body and his blood into the world and soak everybody in this soap. <coughs> this is God's way to wash us in the waters of grace that continually flow from his eternal dwelling. Like those returning from captivity, captives to habits and places. We're captive to a lot of things in this world. And they cause us a wilderness of hopelessness. But that's where John the Baptist shows us how to be a messenger. To cry out in the wilderness. To call out and challenge the wilderness. And say, darkness, get away from me. But you know, wildernesses happen in our lives many times and places. Maybe we've experienced like Cindy, the death of a, of a daughter. She doesn't know which way to turn. Maybe like the Shuits, they've, they've experienced the, the loss of their son. And, and maybe we don't know which way to turn in our lives. Maybe the hopelessness is set in because we have everything we need, you know, but we still have a, a uncertainty about our future, right? And you know what? When hopelessness sets in, you can't get it back yourself. You can't get hope back yourself. That's why we need Jesus Christ. That's why we need to point to him who's coming to give us hope and promise of a new life. And that's why God is coming to us, to love us and, and to share with us all the goodness and blessing that he can with each other. John the Baptist takes on the role of the Old Testament prophets and the angels who were to, to call out to anyone within hearing distance to level the valley, to level the mountains and fill in the valleys so that we could make our way home. That's what it was in the Old Testament. No, no, John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. He's calling out to people to, to level the mountains and fill in the valleys to make the crooked places straight so that God can make his way to us. So that God will come to us. After a hard day in the world, people of God need a bath. After a hard, long year, we need to prepare by sitting in the warm waters of God's grace to let it soak in our muscles and to, to let the soap fill our nostrils with good smells. People of God need to refocus themselves upon what it means to turn and see the light of God's glory coming. Don't get caught up in your own hope. That's a selfish hope. Don't get caught up in your own wants. Make sure you're open. Make sure that you are, are ready for God to say, I'm coming. I'm here. And I'm for you. Amen.